Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black. We are back at it again live because we got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. And I don't know about you, but I have a feeling that I'm going to get some people fired up tonight. I'm going to get y'all a little riled up this evening because the people that we send to Washington who are supposed to represent us, they're failing, and they're failing miserably. I'm having an issue today with, first of all, let me, let me just say this. Puerto Rico is still struggling. The Virgin Islands are still struggling. We still have not passed CHIP to take care of the most vulnerable among us. We are about to create a I don't know, an amazing deficit because of this tax bill, because really it was all about making sure that the donors finally seen some return on their investment in this Republican Party. They're not even hiding it anymore. They're not even pretending like they are trying to appease the American people. The American public said that they did not want this tax bill. Now, if I heard Paul Ryan say once, I've heard him say it ad nauseum that this is what the American people want. Every time they talked about repealing, you know, Obamacare or the uh, uh, health care, this is what the American people want. The American people spoke to you, Paul Ryan, and you ignored them because your donor class said that they wanted a return on their investment. And if y'all don't give them something soon, y'all wouldn't be able to raise any more money when it was time to campaign. See, I got a major problem with this because we sent you, those people who voted for you, sent you to Washington to look out for them. See, the donor class did not give you the 60,000, 30,000, 10,000 votes you needed to win in Wisconsin. Uh, Senator, Senator McConnell, down in Kentucky. Those folks in Kentucky, one of the poorest states in our union. I know good, and good. I know good and well. I almost said something I wasn't supposed to. I had to rein it in a little bit. I know, I know good and well. The folks in Kentucky didn't send you to the Senate to give our money, to give our taxpayer money to big corporations. So they went from 35 to 21 percent, but that's not what the working class got. And their tax breaks are permanent, while ours are temporary. Sure, you're going to see a little bit of money in your pocket right now, but after the election, guess what? Your money goes back up. You're going, oh, well, if we even make it that far, because when Reagan did his tax cuts in 1981, in 82, he had to raise, tax, raise taxes again. So we keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting something different. But I'm going to go take it one step further. Let's talk about net neutrality for just a minute. Republicans have appointed the people at the FCC who voted on to remove. I mean, I, what is wrong with the idea that every, all content on the Internet should be fair and should have the same access? I mean, you're not making billions already now, Mr. AT&T. You're not making billions now, Mr. Xfinity Comcast. You're not making billions now where you actually have to make the traffic all the same. It's not enough money. No. How about the, the fiber lines that you lease to other companies so that they can have their content? But this was the part that got me. Like, Republicans, you pro-business, pro-business, pro-business. Think about this. I'm a techie, so I'm going to break it down like this. We have moved away from server-client applications. Server-client applications mean you have a server in your house, in your office, in your space, in your racks, and it holds your applications. And then you have a, your computer, your computer terminal, and the application is on your computer, and you talk to the server that's in your internal internet, intranet, intranet. So you could access it, whether you had an internet to the outside world, you had your intranet, and you could get to your application. Now that we have ended net neutrality, because think about it, Microsoft moved to Office 365, they decided that, you know, why sell you a disk so you can install Windows and Word on your uh, machine? We'll just host it in the cloud. Businesses are moving away from installing, you know, the office suite. Adobe is moving away from installing the office suite on the workstation, and you access it in the cloud. Well, how much is that going to cost you now? So not only will you have to pay for the application, the license for the application, you're going to have to pay for the highway to get to the application. It's going to change the way you do business. 
business class Republicans? Did you think that far? Did you go that far? Did you think about how it was going to affect small? You swear you down with small businesses? Did you think about that? Of course not, because you're not a part of the donor class. So not only have we increased our inability to communicate with each other over the internet superhighway, we've turned it into essentially a toll road, and you know Comcast can slow down AT&T content, and AT&T can slow down Comcast content, but any other content that they don't want to share openly and freely can be slowed down. I hope your service, uh, you know, s software as a service doesn't get slowed down, business owner, and how you do business. I'll be honest, I work for the government. We have a lot of cloud solutions, but they just stopped taking in revenue now. They just stopped taking in more revenue. I wonder how we in the government, when we are providing services for people, how we're going to be able to pay for our now what we need in internet. It's a double whammy, double whammy. Now I'm gonna. I don't want to spend too much time on my 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 soapbox tonight. I'm hoping that Lane and I can talk about a lot of things like you know that 300 million dollar shortfall that we have in our in our uh, state's education budget because you know we cut corporate taxes so much that we have given back more money in in corporate tax returns than we actually took in in Indiana. I don't know how that work how that math works. And I'm not exactly sure where you're give, getting the money from for the tax return if you didn't get it from the corporations that you're giving it to. I don't know where you got that money from. Oh, you got it from me. Right. So now I am paying for corporate tax returns. Listen, I need y'all to get fired up because 2018 is the year, baby. I'm on my surfboard. I'm riding it blue. I know this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of the story. We have work to do. If you're still sitting on the sidelines and you haven't signed up to run for office, help a campaign, now is the time. I don't want to hear anything about, well, you know, they passed the cut over. The sky is falling. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. 2018, you can have a revolution. And let me introduce you to one of our revolutionaries <laughs> for 2018. One of our revolutionaries for 2018. My man, I had a chance to meet this young man. You know me, I give you a little backstory. I met this young man. Young man. <laughs> oh, yeah, All that's right. what I do. All right. Uh, I went down to Southern Indiana as I, I was making my rounds uh, around uh, uh, the, the state and I'm getting acclimated and here comes this, what are you, 6'2", 6'3"? Six 6'3", six three? Six three on a good day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, casting a nice shadow. But the sweetest spirit and the the most welcoming and warm reception because you know sometimes we as black folks we think we can't we can't leave marion county and be safe that's not true that's not true i'm telling you it's not true you can go anywhere in the state and meet wonderful and caring people all right lane welcome to turn left I'm hyped already, as you can, I can see. I can see that. I can we got see that. some serious things we want to talk about, but I want to make sure that people know why, you know, they should be looking at you in 2018. And I, I know you got a primary, right. so we're, you know, we we got you got to get through that. But tell the people why you would be a good choice. But let's start with who are you, where you come from, why you're here. Well, first thing to thank you for having me here this evening. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure, man. And, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And you promised me that we would not be singing Christmas carols tonight. So, no, so see, no, I'm going to be so honest. To Christmas, so that's good. Christmas is getting in my way. Okay. I got work to do. <laughs> and everybody's talking about, well, let's wait till after the holidays. And I'm like, no, we, we they just passed the tax bill. They're not waiting till after the holidays. Well, they are now. They finally did. Congress finally did pass a little bit of an extension bill. They're gonna, they did extend CHIPS. Uh, children's health uh, insurance for until the okay. 19th of January. They didn't do anything about Puerto Rico. Mm -mm. They left disaster relief on, on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a rough time of getting what they got passed, passed, because they're fighting within their own party mm -hmm. to say, hey, we're not going to extend the debt limit. Well, folks, they just ex cut taxes, and they're going to have to extend that debt limit a lot longer now because Absolutely. of the issues that they've created. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, a whole lot of bit about yourself. A whole lot of bit about myself. I told you before, before I came on here that I one thing I don't like talking about is me and my wife Robin, who's actually sitting off camera here. Hi, Robin. She 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 says, "Well, tell them about yourself and tell them about hey, yourself." Guys. This is real live, baby. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? We're live, baby. Um, 
I'm born and raised in Rising Sun, Indiana. And if you've ever, do you know where Rising Sun is? Have you been to Rising Sun? I have Indiana? not actually been to Rising Sun. Rising no. Sun, Indiana, is located right across the Ohio River from Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. Okay. So if you're okay. ever in Rabbit Hash, you'll be able to look over and see Rising Sun. Okay. So Rising Sun is the county seat of Ohio County, which is the smallest county in the state of Indiana. Okay. There's just about it's six. Smaller than Switzerland. Smaller than Switzerland. We we have a little under six thousand people in the entire county. And Rising Sun's about 2,500 people. And, okay. Uh, I'm a fifth-generation Hoosier. I uh, was born and raised there and uh, went off to college, uh, met my beautiful wife, Robin, uh, my freshman year in college, and, and never looked back uh, at Ball State. And then I went on to law school at uh, McKinney School of Law. It wasn't called McKinney then, in Indianapolis. And, uh, well, i got to ask this question, back though. Again. Did, you, did you go to public schools? I went to Rising Sun High School. Is that a public school? There's only one school in Rising Sun. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, if you want to have an issue about <laughs> private and charter and public schools, we don't have that in the rural communities. Ah. We, we talk about basketball, and we talk about the we talk about Switzerland County because there are rivals. Right. On the river, okay. Okay. And we talk about other things, but we don't talk about school choice because there's only one school. Okay. The small communities are built around these schools and if you don't support your public schools in a small town, you've got problems. Okay. Because that's what people choose and, and that's how they do it. And uh and I I I'm a public uh product of public education. After after Riding Sun High School, went to Ball State University. You went Muncie. to university from a public school. Uh, yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> they, they, you know, public schools actually send you to universities. Well, they do. How about that? Well, they didn't send me. I took a couple well, years from work for a while. Oh, but that's all right. You had after, after unloading trucks for a couple of okay, years, I decided okay. the college education wasn't that bad of an investment. No, it wasn't. And so then I went back and, okay. and went to college after that. And after college, I worked in the banking industry for a while. After working in banking for a couple of years, and then I decided I want to try law school. Okay. And went to law school, graduated in uh, 1990 okay. from law school, and then went right back to Rising Sun. I actually got involved in a state senate race that year, ran for the Indiana State Senate. Okay, excellent. Didn't win, but had some really good experiences and uh, kind of whet my appetite for politics at that point. And it was then we started having kids. Rob and I had three kids. We've been married 35 years. 35 years. She, she wow. Was, she, she was, uh, she, it wasn't one of those Roy Moore deals. She was, you know, <laughs> she was pretty young. I was going to ask because she's still looking kind of young. That's but now that say. I know, yeah, thanks I, for clarifying. Yeah, it wasn't you, one just, of, you just take very good care of her. We take real good care of her. <laughs> yeah, we're, that's, we're, I got it. We take real good care of her. But uh, <laughs> third year of law school, 1990, uh, we had uh, twins. A boy oh, and a girl. Okay, okay. Um and then later on, ten years later, it took a while to start over, we had our third child a daughter. Okay. Uh the twins are now what, twenty eight and uh one is a uh, captain in the United States Army. Okay. Um graduate of West Point. Wow. Uh, you wanna talk about public schools? He went to the same high school I went to. And and it produced a, a student and he, that go to West he Point. He got admitted to West Point and my daughter lives in Fortville, right here in Hancock County, and she is a librarian. She's got her uh master's degree from uh, Indiana University Excellent. Excellent. And, and we're still working on Carly she's at home and uh, attending Ivy Tech okay and uh, just got her first report card and she's doing really well there so That's we're proud awesome. of all the kids well, three for three everything. in college three for three uh, I've been uh, practicing law and rising sun for now 20 27 years why almost. are you staying in rising sun you went to law school <laughs> what, you could leave Indiana I could but there weren't any other lawyers in town and, and at the time when I got came back to town my dad uh was retiring. He was president of the bank. He never went to college. Okay. He got he ran, wow. he worked his way up to being president of the bank, and he said, you know, you could probably practice here. And so I started. Literally hung out my shingle and been in small town law practice ever okay. since. Okay. Okay. So there's it's about community for you. It is totally about community. Uh, we're a hundred percent involved in our community. I'm uh, uh, I've been in the Rotary Club. I've been in the Chamber of Commerce. I've been uh, I'm president of the Historical Society. Uh, I'm uh, president of my church board. Uh, it's 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 those things that really mean small town here in America, and uh, I, I'm really proud of Rising Sun, and uh, uh, and I'm going to promote it every chance I get. That's awesome. I mean, I think it's fantastic because you know those of us that live in in Indianapolis sometimes we get caught up in what's going on in our mm -hmm. you know almost a million people space. Um, but the small town is still, you know, you, st you guys have unique struggles. Um, and are they being addressed? Do you feel that they're being addressed, especially with, you know, the person that's in the seat now? We I give everybody one chance to say who the incumbent is. Mm -hmm. Who is it? Oh, in Congress? Yeah. 
Guy yeah. named Luke Messer. Okay, okay, that's all you yeah. can hear. We don't say his name no more. Okay, um, I'm not running against him though. Oh, Luke's, Luke's, he's Luke's retiring? Thinks, Luke thinks he's going to be a senator, but Joe Donnelly's going to oh, do something right, about that. Oh, that's right, right, right. So that's I'm not bad. running against Luke Messer. I uh, there are three yeah. Republicans running for the seat. Okay. Uh, as well as right now, so it's, three Democrats. So it's so. almost an open seat if he well, gets if he gets the nomination in the in the spring. There's a guy named uh, Pence. Pence, yeah, 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 yeah. He thinks um, he thinks he can just do what his brother's doing. But, yeah, um, well, that's uh, I always say the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, or Shyster's running the same family. I don't know. I, I don't Some, know about I, that. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Shysters. I just say the bigger they are, yeah. the harder they fall. Fake. Fake. I mean, it, it's amazing to me how the, the, that you know Mike Pence is able to say the things that he says with a straight face. You know, Dana, tone. I watched him at the cabinet meeting yesterday, oh. and he literally had notes talking about all the wonderful things that oh. the president has done, and he was quibbling and, and and sitting there and saying all these words, trying to say how proud he was and all that. It honestly disturbed me. Oh. Because, you know, you can say you're proud of someone, but the level and the length that he went to to make that statement, it was scary. Yeah, and see, like, I'm, I'm a comedian by nature, <laughs> and there have been, like, a lot of jokes that I've had running around in my head, but I also want to run for office at another date, so I haven't actually said them or typed. I've typed them yeah. and deleted them, but it's like, I, I want to, I mean, honestly, as a woman, as a woman who is almost a half a century, and living in a patriarchal society where uh, he man, I'm man, I'm right. manly man, I'm right. man. Where are the real men in our Congress right now? I have never seen so much lovey. D I want to say something so bad. Y'all have no idea how. Okay. But my question is: Is where are the real men? You can't answer that because you've been in Rising Sun. I can't. You can't. You know. You know, I, I've been blessed in my life to grow up with strong women. Right. My mother was a strong woman. I mean, she was one of the first um, EMS, uh, EMTs, female EMTs in the state. Okay. okay. And uh, she actually raised us kids to, to believe that women has rights. Okay. And then I married a strong woman. Come on. I already know that. And she, and, you know, and I believe that, you know, that is what makes me me. You know, the women that surround me, my family that surrounds me, I'm proud of them. And, uh, yeah, every time you make a decision, whether it's in private life or in public life, you have to look out and say, what's going on there? And then I have strong daughters. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I believe that you have to raise strong daughters and strong sons and to make a future for this country. Yeah, well, I just want those dudes in Congress to man up. Oh, my God, stop <laughs> kissing that dude like that. Your chips ought to be, your, the lips ought to be checked right now. Oh, my God, stop it. Stop kissing his behind. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, oh, that's, that was soft because y'all have no idea. So you, you, you see what's going on. You ran for Senate. It didn't yep. work out for you. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't give up. You, did, you decided, you know, okay, well, not right now. This is not my time. Mm -hmm. Why are you back in it again? Well, I actually ran for Congress in 2014. That was okay. a year uh, I lost in the primary. Uh, I don't think anybody voted that year. No, I mean, it was the lowest turnout in history. We Indiana was 50 out of 50. Yeah, we had a low turnout in the general, and, mm -hmm. and the primary was dismal as well. Yeah, yeah. And nobody was, nobody was excited. Nobody was interested in right. politics. And they didn't realize the impact that the political process has on our daily lives. Absolutely. Because you get up in the morning and you look out, is the road there? Yeah, that's, that's a process of politics. Does the water turn on? Does the electricity turn on? All the things that go on, now the Internet, all the things that we enjoy and we believe in in this country are given to us by the society we live in, and that's governed by the political process. Absolutely, and, and the Constitution says, the biggest three words on that thing says, we the people. We the people. So we are in charge of our government. We can say right. what it should and what it shouldn't be doing. But but here you are again. Okay, so you, you, try, you keep trying. What are you, what are you trying to do? Well, uh, first of all, I woke up uh, last uh, November, like everybody mm -hmm. else, and I looked at what happened, and it scared me. It scared me for the future of this mm -hmm. country. Um, you know, the level of uh, venom that was mm -hmm. in that campaign. I don't like you. You don't like me. Um, all the things that went on made me think, you know, people have given up on the political process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're turned off by it. Yeah. They don't want to vote. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And they don't want to believe that it's important. But yeah. when we start talking about bread and butter issues, 
you know, our individual rights, uh, our, our economic uh, benefit, all the things that go on, we have to come back and put people who are concerned and active and caring back in the political process. Absolutely, and I, I don't even think we realize um, um, how much of an impact we can have on an election. Alabama, to me, is that you know, prime exa mm -hmm. example. As an African American female, we always know we're the lowest one on the totem pole. Always have been. We know this, right? But, and and let's be let's be real, y'all. Alabama has a thirty percent population of African Americans, so they, they their it's their fair. power they it, had a, power. it was it was more power than than they thought. And even with you know the voter ID laws that they passed in Alabama, and then after they passed the voter voter ID laws, they started systematically closing down BMVs mm -hmm. where you went to go get them. So they were doing everything they could to disenfranchise people of color and and get them away from or giving you know take that power away from voting. They still mobilized. Right. They still you know remember their you know Montgomery bus boycott roots and and posse up and and said yo we are not sending this pedophile to Congress well you know the Alabama election uh, was one of those things where they got very close to doing it only about less than 40 percent of the people that were eligible to vote in Alabama actually voted in mm -hmm. that special election and they said that that was the best turnout they'd had in a long time they said those are, those were Obama numbers yeah those it, were Obama numbers and to think that someone with that background and that history got that close to being elected to the United <laughs> States Senate, that's scary. Yeah. And that's scary about the what's what's going on. I mean, yeah. we had yeah. a speaker of the House who was a child molester. Yeah. We didn't know it. He went to prison after he left office. But but, but, but these folks knew it, yeah, and they, they were still it. saying, eh. We'll overlook you know, that. We'll overlook. I mean, and it's almost, even with the White House, and I've kind of mentioned this before, and I have to be careful with some of the things that I say because I don't want people to think that I'm a conspiracy theorist. But I really do believe that the Republican Party, like, you know, gave up the sanctity of our White House and the Oval Office to pass some of this ludicrous le legislation just so they could have a, a Nickum poop, you know, sign off on it. I mean, they real. I mean, it was... I'll be real. It's almost like you, mm -hmm. you remember back in the day, and we we don't like to talk about it, but remember back in the day when African Americans moved into a community, the the housing, uh, the, the the housing prices dipped. When when black folk, you probably don't remember because you come from a small well, town. Well, we only have like we don't have that many houses around. Okay. Town, so. <laughs> well, yeah. when, especially when they did redlining. So the, in neighborhoods mm -hmm. where there were people of color, the property values were lower. Mm -hmm. It's almost like because the Obamas were in the White House, the property value and the value of the Oval Office tanked. And they just put anybody in there so they can pass these le these these this legislation to you know disenfranchise and make life harder because they knew they could. How could you not want an upstanding individual to be the president of the United States? What where did we go wrong? Well, they were so anxious to get someone in there who was not Obama, mm -hmm. who would sign whatever they put in front of them. Yep, that's it. And it's not about you know there there is a, there is a color problem and the color is green. Mm, hello. Uh, there, in there this country that. right now, our government has been for sale. When we put that tax bill together, when the Congress put that tax bill together, there were over six thousand lobbyists that had that paperwork. Nobody in the Senate saw that bill before it showed up, but their lobbyists were sitting out there saying, "Oh, I want this and I want that." Well, will you trade me this or trade me that? And no people. But none of the we're elected officials. There. The elected officials were not writing the bills. We've turned our government over to the lobbyists, and the lobbyists are writing the bills, and they're doing that because money is the power in Washington. Absolutely. But the other part about that is there are more of us than there are of these power brokers. Right. Even though what you're saying is absolutely the truth, I don't want people to get discouraged and think, well, if I don't have any money, I don't have any power. No, 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 no. There's, you know, there's a reason why they're called the 1%. There's only 1% of right. them. The rest of us have to galvanize, and we have to understand the importance of electing, you know, balance. You know, you don't have to like all Democrats, but there's got to be balance. So tell me, tell us, you know, you got your kid. I know this, today I'm hyped. I'm sorry. You know, I'm gonna, <laughs> and I'm going to bring it back because I really want people to know who you are. Uh, tell us about, your, you, you know, what you're campaigning on right now and what your issues are that you're focusing on that, that are in the 6th District. Well, the issues in the 6th District are the same as they are in the rest of the country. The first thing is we've got to resolve the issue about health care. Yes. We've not resolved it. In fact, the new uh, tax bill destroys it further by giving a disincentive to people to get out because no right. longer uh, they have to worry about a tax uh, right. consequences. So they can just say, oh, I'll just go without health insurance. But if you're going without health insurance, it's like going without car insurance. Yep. You have that accident or you have that major illness 
that puts you back in the hospital, who's going to pay for it? You don't have the money to pay for it. You're heading towards bankruptcy. You're heading towards uh, personal devastation. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You're still not paying for it. Well, who pays for it? All the other people in the healthcare system are paying the bills for the uninsured in this country. Absolutely. And until we get some type of health insurance for everybody, universal coverage, Medicare he for said all, it. Medicare for all, he said it is the way to the future. To, I didn't even have to pry it out of them, y'all. Well, Medicare is has <laughs> the lowest over uh, the lowest overhead of any healthcare program in the country. Wow. I mean, they're half they're half the overhead of private insurance. So, so the system is there. The system is working. Well, they say, well, I don't want to pay for your health insurance. But guess what? You're going to pay for it anyway. We're just going to buy from a different company. We're going to buy from a company called the United States of America. Yes. And, you know, and it's going to go the same way. It doesn't matter where your health care dollars go. It matters how they're spent and how we save those health care dollars. Come on. You know, 33 industrialized countries in the world, we're the only one. It does not have universal health care. <sighs> so that's an issue for everyone. And I know I'm in a rural district. We have people out there who drive tractors every day, that work mm -hmm. hard in the fields mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. They need health insurance, too. Absolutely. And the hardest place to buy health insurance is when you're on the farm. Absolutely. You know, if you don't have a wife that works like I do, okay, I wouldn't have health insurance. Right, right. That's why right. she works. Right. I, I literally, I, my wife has a business, a very successful That's business. That's right. But it is cheaper for her to be on my health insurance because I work for the city. Yeah, and everybody deals with that. But the thing yeah. is, okay, so let's take health insurance off the table. What's that do to small businesses? Well, it allows you to compete with big businesses. Well, who doesn't want you to compete with them? Big business. Big, no, they don't. Big money. I mean, Back to that again. What happened to the, again, real men stand up? Because when you, <laughs> when you, or real, real women, because I know some b women business owners would be like, I don't want competition. What's wrong with competition? Competition is important. Was, I thought that's what would made us great. Competition oh, you, is important. You it's, the ability, it's, it's the way that the system works. The invisible hand of Adam Smith, he came out in the Wealth of Nations in 1776, said money will follow where it's needed and to be used the right way because of this invisible mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. That's based upon competition. Well, if you ever played a game of Monopoly and everybody gets mad because somebody gets all the good properties, that's when the competition disappears. Absolutely. Well, we've Absolutely. got to get that back into, into, into okay. the country. Okay. And health insurance for all. The second thing in a rural district is we've got to have jobs. We've okay. got to create those kind of opportunities, and that's infrastructure investment. We've got to have sewer systems, water systems. We've got to have that inter internet. Mm -hmm. We need to bring fiber into every house in this country. Ooh, fiber okay. in every house. The ability fiber. to sit at home and do the kind of things we're doing right now. Talk around not the fiber world. Not to the pole. Not to the pole, but to, to the, the house. house. To the house. And so the kids, when the snow day hits, they don't get to go out in the snow and play all day. They, they have can to still sit go down. to school? They have to still go to school. Mm. Don't worry about it, kids. Still vote for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you still have to if, go if to school. 18, don't worry you about can it. have an internet school day, so you're, you're good there. Yeah, but you can do it when you're at home and you relax, you can stay in your gym. And the other aspect there is we've got to preserve and support public education. Mm. We've fought for years to have the best education system in the, in the world. world. In the world. And Indiana has wonderful public education. Absolutely. And then about 10 years ago, under that guy we wouldn't mention his name, he, he rushed through some of the biggest school choice programs in the country and devastated small schools and other schools in this state. My little community, we had to go out and raise taxes a year ago in order to hmm. support the general fund of our school. Wow. Because of all the things that were going on, oh. the money's just not there. Invest in education, you invest in the future. But you know what they've done, though? And this is, I'm glad you're sharing the story about the small communities, the rural communities. What they've done is packaged it as it's only the urban schools. No. And, and, and it's only those, those, those other school systems with those other mm -hmm. people, wink, wink, nod, nod, brown and black, where they, they want our tax dollars. They want us. You're telling me in rural communities where there's not a lot of racial diversity. You guys are struggling the same way some of our urban schools are? Everyone's struggling because of the way we're cutting money on schools. I thought we made a, I thought we made a social commitment to educate our children because an educated society is a society is a successful society. Well, the, uh, actually the Constitution of the state of Indiana Mm, provides that students, the state will provide a free public education to all students. They didn't it, tell you what the quality would be, though. They did not say what the quality would be. But everyone said, you know, when I was growing up, and my, you know, I went to the same school, my kids went to the same school, my father, my grandfather, we all went to the same school. We're proud of our school. It's a small school. We don't have fancy auditoriums and things like that, but we've got the good basic education that you need. 
And those opportunities exist all over the state. Absolutely. And the 19th district has a lot of small schools and a lot of rural areas that are that are struggling, and they need that and they need that support. And so, when you get to Congress, uh, <laughs> one of the things, yeah, well, you know, well, if you get to Congress, let me say that because there's a couple good Democrats out there, uh, and I, I'm gonna, I'm, I gotta, you know, I gotta be fair, I gotta be fair, I gotta be fair, fair, right? If you get to Congress, what yeah. is the first piece of legislation you want to work on? Well. Uh, you know, there's so many. I know, right? I mean, and every day you turn around, something else is going on. One of the things we've got to do is we've got to go back and fix the problems that have been created over the last year. Yeah, we can do that because we, we're, we, we're we, seeing we, the we, blueprint we, we, on all you got to do is just undo what the last president did. You, you, we, we, and then first you start year, over. success! You start over and you, <laughs> you start protecting the environment again. You start supporting the education again. You start making the Internet uh, neutral so yes. that people don't. We do all those things. We go back and we make tax laws that give tax breaks to working people and not to corporations. Come on, come We have on. to do that. And those are, what are what's really important to me. And you know what I find? I, even though I know people don't want to pay taxes, we all would rather Nobody just does. have all of our money. I think those of us who get it understand that we have to take care of our nation. There are things that we just have to pay for. And tax dollars pay for those things. I like knowing that if I drive across the bridge, I'm going to make it to the other side. And that, I mean, that's serious business. Well, taxes are the price that we live for living. We pay for living in a civilized society. Absolutely. I mean, if if you want to go off in the woods and eat, eat pine cones or something, I'm not doing You that. probably could get a pretty low tax rate yeah, out of that. I'm not doing but that. if you want to be a part of a society that moves forward, that provides the things that we've come to depend on, and then you have to understand that there is a tax burden there. Now, that tax burden has to be fair and has to be shared. I, I got a cousin who always said that when he died, he wanted to leave all his bills to someone who could afford them. <laughs> well, that's the same thing in our society. We have to... We <laughs> have like to, one of my cousins. We, yeah, we have to make sure <laughs> that the people who get the most benefit out of society pay their fair share. Absolutely. I mean, and, and here's the thing that, that really annoys me, right? You we're able to set up a successful business because of of what our country affords you <laughs> the opportunities to you know to to really create you have an idea and watch it flourish and create something from it now that you're successful you don't want to give back you you i understand people are talking about well you know our our corporate tax rate isn't competitive around the world I don't see the United States struggling well, you know, to, to, to our businesses, our companies in the United States struggling to compete around the world. I've just not seen it because we are the, whether people agree with it or not, they always look to the United States as leaders of industry, as leaders of technology, as leaders of software. They take our ideas to their countries. So I, I don't understand this, this notion that I don't feel like I need to give back and I, I need to keep all of it for myself. I'm going to stack my chips and I'm, you, good luck to you. What well, is that? Well, this is a new thought pattern in this country yeah. because in the past we weren't that well, selfish. They did it. Well, in 1928 they were. Well, and guess what happened then? <laughs> 1928. Yeah, 1928. We had a great, uh, a lot of wealth, you know, that came to the top end, and obviously that caused problems. After World War II, we were the biggest, strongest, most successful country in the world, and we were paying off bills for not only our country but for other countries. Yes. And in the Eisenhower administration, Truman administration, we had tax rates of 90 percent at the top level. Right. I'm that not. Might be those were high. Even John, John F. Kennedy ran on a tax cut plan. Right. It I mean, did not pass while he was in alive. It passed in 1964, right. and that was the first major tax cut. But, but those no, tax cuts are one way of looking at things. But the thing is, there was a thought in this world that we stand up for our country and we put our money in our country. After 9/11, after well, after Pearl Harbor, they stood up and everyone went and joined up. We bought war bombs and we made all sorts of sacrifices in this country. Absolutely. After 9-11, they told us to go to the mall. It, well, you know, I mean, uh, it, you know, you get from a, 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 a semi-successful business owner who's every, every business he had failed. But the commitment... That's what he tells you. But even, even people who were, who were wealthy had a commitment to the welfare of this country. Absolutely. They understood that a rising tide lifts all boats, but a lot of the boats today have got holes in them. Absolutely. They're not rising with the rest of it. But they're stacking their chips, man. They're stacking their chips because they, they've done this before. Mm -hmm. They see what's going to happen. They knew a tax cut plan is it's going to create a recession. It's going to increase the deficit. And, and so, so we already know that Paul Ryan, his goal now, okay, step one, lower taxes. Step two, they like to call them entitlements. 
And I hate that word mm -hmm. because I don't think anybody who is living off of Social Security feels entitled. Wait, we pay for Social Security. Like, right, right. But I think they feel like they're surviving, right? Or if they're having to use Medicare and Medicaid, I don't think they think that they're entitled. It's like a, it's something that they need to mm -hmm. have. Um, so they, I mean, the idea that I want to keep more money for myself because I have abundance of health care and abundance of education, but I don't want you to be able to have that. Right. Where, where, where did we go wrong, boss? Well, first of all, Social Security and Medicare are not entitlements. We pay for Social Security and Medicare. Our seniors deserve to live in dignity. It comes out of your check. The program's standing up there. Now, the government did go back in a few years ago and borrow a lot of that money back. Yes, they did. Say, oh, Grandma, can I have the cookie jar money? I just need to go downtown for a bit. Well, they took it. And now Grandma's sitting there retired saying, well, where's the cookie jar money? Well, we'll get it back to you. We'll get it back to you. But they have no desire. You know, legally, they call them entitlements under the law because you can't take them away from people. Right. And Paul, uh, Paul Ryan said that when he was in college, he dreamed of ending Medicare. Oh. Now, when I was in college, I didn't dream of ending Medicare. I don't know, Robin. We, we never talked about that in college. So uh, it, it's one of those things. And wasn't he, like, there on, like, a student loan? Wasn't he, like, getting he, government money when he was in school? He got, he got uh, I think, Social Security or something, something to help pay for school for him. I, I had student loans. And, and yeah, luckily, luckily, I went back. long enough ago that my students were pretty cheap, so oh. I got them. They're taken care of. Yeah. Um, I paid them back, basically. I'm, I'm, I, they get a check from me every month. But but Paul Ryan has this mindset that you know people get what they get because of who they are, and there's been an attack on poor people in this country. I don't even understand that, and they're not even poor. <laughs> and I think hmm, I want to. I like to clarify. I like to call them the working poor. Because, you know, these folks get up every day. Mm -hmm. They go to work sometimes with two and three jobs. Sometimes they, you know, their kids are not, you know, are being watched by strangers or by relatives because they want to make sure there's a roof over their head or they want to make sure that they have food in their bellies. And, and the idea that you can't see these people, you can't see our neighbors, because that's who they are. They're not some strangers off in the distance. Right. They're our neighbors. They are the people that ring us out at Walmart. Well, that comes back to what they think the purpose of government is. Mm -hmm. And there are people in Washington today who think that government is being run by the corporations and for the corporations. And the purpose of a corporation is maximization of shareholder wealth. Yes. That's their goal, whole goal in I'm life. A, I'm going to steal that. That's the reason we have corporations. Yes. But government is supposed to be for the people. The people gave power to the government, the people gave control to the government, and the people trust the government to look out for them. But if the government doesn't look out for all the people and only looks out for the corporations, then we've got problems. I think I hear an echo. Hello. I think I hear an echo. Hello. How many times have I said that? So, you know, Lane, it sounds like, you know, you, I'm, I'm feeling you, right? I'm, and I think the voters out there are, are going to like your message because you were talking about the same thing that we as Democrats talk about because the show is called Turn Left. You know, you're on the Democrat side. You're a mm -hmm. Democrat. Part. We care about the people. You know, I how are we going to get our message out? You know, first of all, I don't even consider myself on the left. Oh. I, I took one of those little oh, online what tests. Happened? Well, one of those little <laughs> on, took one of those little online tests and said, "What do you believe about this issue? This issue? This issue?" Came back and said, "You're a Repu you're an Eisenhower Republican." That's how much further this country has gone to the right in the last several years, but also you have that to remember, the things that we're talking about, that 50 years ago they would have said this is something that we should strive to, all yeah. of a sudden becomes something that's leftist and socialist, and that's not true. Well, but see, but then we had the 1964 Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. uh, Civil Rights Act, and 1965 Voting Rights Act, and you know them parties switched. Right. That was after Eisenhower. So, you know, I probably would have been an Eisenhower Democrat. I mean, Republican. You know what I'm saying? Well, if you look at the if you look at the issues, yeah, the things did change. But I I just bring that out as an example. Uh, we're being painted sometimes the Democratic Party as being out of touch, not knowing what's going on. And but you know true. what? If your measuring stick is getting longer and longer and longer, it's hard to come up to the same level. And they've moved the the framework so far to the right. We have a 24 hour a day sound machine called Fox News that makes everything an issue. I call and, it phone and news. <laughs> phone news. Faux news. Faux. 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 Faux news. Yeah, I bought Robin. Like I was going to buy Robin a faux fur, <laughs> but I said I don't believe in killing foes. So okay. <laughs> faux news. We, we should not kill foes. But but the thing is, we're not. 
you know, we're not <laughs> drifting to the left. We're staying where we were. Exactly. Fighting to hold on to what we got. Exactly. And everybody's working hard. And that's the part that kills me. It's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've had a chance to visit. I counted the counties. John Zodi and I sat down one day and we started checking off all the counties we've been to since the election. Mm-hmm. I'm, I've made it to 24. Of the 92. Of I have 92. Yeah, I still got a long way to go. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'll be there. But one of the things we, we there's, a, there's a common thread that we're, we're seeing throughout our state. And, and it's not just, you know, anger and resentment towards the election that how did we, how did our country get to the point where we elect somebody who's a failure at everything that he does, um, and, and he's orange. Uh, we've gotten past that to, wait a second, how, how am, where am I going to work? We, we got factories shutting down. Well, how am I going to get retrained? How, how am I, how, what am I leaving for my kids? I want my kids to have a better future than what I'm, what I'm having. I mean, I think our generation, if I had children now, my kids would probably be like in their 20s or so. And I believe that my, my, gener- my generation of parents are like, our kids are not going to be as well off as we are. That's we scary. are the, We are the beginning trend of the other side. I'm mm-hmm. a Gen Xer. I know people think that I'm a millennial. Dude, I would be birth. I had a millennial. I would have had a millennial. I'm if a, I had a boomer. Kid. See, I, I'm right behind you. I'm right behind you. So, so how, you know, how, what do you, what do you tell folks um, when when you see that they are just you know digging down deep as they can, trying to pull themselves up? Because I, prime example, I, when the disaster hit Scott County a couple years back, the, the tornadoes, and we went down as uh, as the state. I worked for the IT department. We set up the, the food stamps and emergency help. There wasn't a lot of traffic because, you know, neighbors helped each other. Right. And when you have communities that are working that hard to help themselves and every time they try to claw, I'm talking about rural communities, how do we tell them, listen, the policies that are being created are, are the reasons why you're in the space that you're in. How do we get them to see the other side of it? Well, I, uh, I work with a lot of city and county boards and deal with a lot of Republicans. And once you get down to the, the base level, people are pretty much the same. They're always, their concerns are about the benefit of their community, the benefit of their fellow man. It's when we nationalize and start saying them and us instead of just us, mm-hmm. that's when the problem is created. And we can solve things pretty simply if we sit down with the same goals in mind of making a difference. You said we're worried about our children's future. I'm worried about my children's future. I mean, the, the quality of, of life has to continue to rise in this country. Uh, you know, it's not making more money. No. Millennials no. are millennials say right now their concerns are not making more money. It's, it's a being able to balance. it's being able to have a work life balance, being able to, to get the most out of life. And I think that's a great goal and that's a great opportunity. Absolutely. We're not measuring ourselves by how big our house is or how many cars we own or all the other things. We're going to measure ourselves by how good of a person we can yes. be and how much of a life we can live and how much of a lasting influence we can have. So I'm concerned about that. And the only way we can do this is having a government that is centered around people and not centered around corporations. I agree. A government that looks in and says, well, what does this do to my neighbor? Yes. What does this do to my friends? What does this do to the people I go to church with? Yes. That's the question you have to ask. And when I go to Congress, those are the questions I'll ask. Uh, yes. Not what, you know, not is this good for XYZ Corporation? Yes. Is this good for Bob? Is this good for the guy down the street? That's exactly That's the question you have to ask. That was exactly what I was thinking when, you know, Dude was uh, the FCC chair was talking about net neutrality and getting rid of it. And I kept I, kept, I just wanted to ask the one question. How does this help the citizens of the United States? How does how does ending net neutrality help the citizens of the United States? I don't have a big enough voice yet. I am not I know y'all think I'm loud and I am. But I'm not loud enough to get to D.C. to ask that question, and nobody really asked it, and I was disappointed in that. How does ending net neutrality help the citizens of the United States? It doesn't. And until we hold people accountable to those type of questions, they might not care. Yeah, obviously, they don't care that whether or not something benefits the people or not. So how do we, you know... We, we got to vote them out, right? Well, the thing is, if you talk about net neutrality, you notice that a couple of major uh, cable corporations just today announced high, hike rates for next, next year. Um, <sighs> they're already that. saying, well, we're going to start profit, you know, making more money, more money. Remember, the goal of a corporation is maximization of shareholder wealth. 
We created and, the environment for And them. if we give Verizon or AT&T or anyone else the ability to throttle our new internet or charge us more because we, we watch this or give them preferred services or whatever, then we don't have the ability. Remember, the internet was started by the government. It was started by the government. It's under the Department of Defense. It Arpanet. was created. And and there's there's way and it's just become you something. Know I knew that, did you? It, it, they call it remember the next wave, the third wave. The mm-hmm. internet has brought us forward, and they've actually sustained a lot of the productivity in this country for the last uh, last decade. Yes. And yes. what we're going to say is okay. Well, what they said was well, the internet was created. There were no rules. And everything went fine, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. No, 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 no. Well, you know, they build an interstate. I drove up here on the interstate. Well, if I decide to stop in the inter- middle of the interstate and start charging the people behind me to go around my car, I could make some pretty good money. Right, right. And, you know, I think that's a good idea. But what am I doing? I'm taking a public highway, turning it into my own private toll road. Absolutely. Well, that's what these companies want to do. They want to take this public highway of the Internet and turn it into their own toll road and charge and you. And they're already doing it because we created an environment for them to do it. I have always said businesses to maximize their dollars. Government is to make sure that those business, businesses don't right. harm the citizens or the environment. Yep. And here you have a situation where now, you know, you already have communities that do not have high-speed Internet. They're not getting it mm-hmm. because they're not going to be able to afford it. Right. You already have school systems who are struggling to have Internet. They're not going to get it. And, and the idea that we are allowing this to happen because we want to sit out of elections or... You know, she really just didn't fire me up like that. I, I don't know. I just didn't win another Clinton. I, oh my God, she, I just, they cheat. All, all of that. All of that. Well, look where we are. Well, the, the election preyed on people's fears. They did. They said, this person is going to hurt you. What about the emails? What about all this? And them damn emails. <laughs> we're finding out about the emails of the other guy now. Oh so my God. I, it, it, it's, it's always going to be something. But if you're scared of these people, you're less likely to vote for them. And I think a lot of people just got scared to vote at all. They did. They said, I'm not going to be the one responsible for this. So they sat it out. and Or they got so scared. I mean, my neighbor had Hillary for prison signs in, in their uh, yard. I didn't even know those people voted. And I'm not sitting up here telling you that Hillary was a saint. She was, a, she was an angel, and everything that the Clintons have done over the last 30 years was, was fantastic. Right. But at least I know that she know, ain't number one knew how to run government. She knew how to not embarrass us all over the world, mm-hmm. not have to sit there literally with my arms folded, waiting for everyone to, I know you almost said something you weren't supposed to say, uh, uh, make me feel more manly. I knew, you knew that she was going to run our government the way it was supposed to be ran. And guess what? She would have had the veto power for the, the tax bill, and she would have appointed the chair of SEC, and we would not be having the discussion about net neutrality. Every Obama executive order, because it's really all about, you know, trying to erase, you, you're you never going to erase Obama. He was number 44. It's go, It went down in history. You can't, I know that you think you can, when you say you're fired, you think people just disappear into a uh, smoke of dust. They might. Yeah, but it, it's not going to. Not him, no. and, and he's still young and, and, and has a lot of vigor, so he's still showing up everywhere getting more tweet numbers. I think that's kind of cute. But anyway, if you had just, like, if we had just looked at our government for what it really is versus what it, what they thought they were getting, which is, you know, well, he's ran a business. No, he hasn't. <laughs> into the ground. And, and he's not been <laughs> successful. You know. Well, uh, the election of 2016 was an election of fear. It was an election that people were scared of what's going to happen. I mean, on both sides. But there are really some deep issues in this country. You know, wages have stagnated. People are not getting Talk ahead. People have to work two jobs, three jobs to make a living. Talk about They're it. They're not getting the opportunities that they deserve. And the answers that keep coming out is, okay, a tax cut. Well, a tax cut, and I don't know if you've done, there's not been a lot of analysis on it, but I can tell you right now, it's 500 bucks a year. If that it's, much. It, it, and guess what? It goes away. It, and that's the, that was the It purpose. goes away. That's the, like, so when I it's listen $500 to, a year, and it goes away. When I hear Republicans. I'll take the 500 Yes, but it, can, how come mine can't be permanent like the, 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 the corporate tax rate is permanent? Well, it's the size of your voice. I know you've got a great voice. I, I do. <clears throat> but you don't have the billion dollar I don't have voice. the billion, but you know what? You know, you don't have the voice that writes those checks. Yeah. And that makes the big difference in Washington. This is a bill written by the lobbyists for large multinational corporations. It made promises that yes. they will not keep. 
And we're going to end up here in a, in a couple of years wondering why we, they did that. Now, and, and history is not silly, right? History t is supposed to teach you something. And humans will do what they need to do when they are desperate. And I don't believe when, when, when people are crafting legislation that omits 98% of a society are, and, and really creates a desperate situation for the most vulnerable among us. They have not thought about the consequences of that yet. I am not advocating for anything, but humans are who they are. They've been humans for a long time. Nothing changes. History tells us what happens when you continue to oppress the masses. I don't want to see my country in flames. Mm -hmm. I do not. But I know what I know why there was a French Revolution. I know why there was a Bol Bolshevik Revolution. We don't want those things. But people will do desperate things when when they when they find themselves hungry, when they find themselves desperate. People, I want you to take that energy and take it to the ballot box. I want you to take that energy and work for Lane or work for the candidate of your choice to get them elected. Let's use that energy that is because that energy is bubbling. It's bubbling. We are the oldest, most successful republic in the history of the world. 200 years is most, what most people But hear. democracy is not something that's given. It's something that's earned. It's yes. something you have to fight for, for every day. You have to go out and you talk about revolution. Every two years. I think of the Beatles song. You say you want a revolution. Yeah. But guess what? We have, right, we have a revolution every election. That's we right. have an opportunity to choose our government. And the only thing that can stand up for you in Washington, D.C., is someone who represents you, that listens to you, that comes out and holds town halls. You're not going to cancel it at the last minute? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> I, I, I've been to Scottsburg. I don't have any security concerns at all in Scottsburg. That's a great town. I've been to Scottsburg, it's a and great I town. don't have any security issues. You know, that's, they, that was a ninth district deal, but I know. But wait. you know what, Our, this guy we wouldn't talk about. He didn't have any town halls. No, I, he doesn't I, come around and listen to people. You have a right to talk to your congressperson. You're paying. You them. have a right to tell them what you think. You have the right to yell at them every once in a while. You, are, you can't throw you things. No, you can't no, throw things. No you shoes. can't do anything like no. that. No, do that, that you've got the right to complain in this country. Absolutely. Use it. And you've got the biggest right there is to franchise the ability to exercise your vote. If mm. you don't do that, you will be hurt and everybody you know will be hurt. And we can't be passive. We, we've allowed the trinkets and the toys mm -hmm. and the shiny objects. I mean, literally, we have create, there are spaces where you never actually have to leave your home. Well, you know, so you can have your food delivered. You can have your fresh groceries delivered. You know, you can work from home. Well, not where I live yet. Well, well, well I, I, you know, <laughs> but, but but where the, the larger populations are, right? They they've created a space where you you are entertaining yourself and yeah. you never leave the house. Well, the millennials have to come out and they got to get involved. Absolutely. All everyone has to get involved because it's your future we're talking about. Absolutely. It's you who will have to pay the bill. And someone said the other day, I feel I am ashamed to be a baby boomer because of the condition we've left this country in. And how much debt we've lived in. The I'm just trying to figure out what happened to the Woodstock baby boomers. I mean, the, well, what the, happened to them? Well, the baby boomers, you know, they, they, li they lived a charmed life. And I will tell you, it was a charmed life. When I grew up, my mom stayed home all day long. We had a station wagon. There were five of us. We had, you know, we'd get in the station wagon, no seat belts, nothing. We'd just go head on down the road. That was the, the nuclear family of the 60s. Today's families are completely different. You know, mom has to work two jobs. Dad has to work two jobs. A lot of times they're not even together. And, you know, kids are, you know, go home in, in the afternoon after school and open the door and they sit there and watch TV for a couple of hours before someone can come home. The reason for that is because we don't have the finan financial ability to stay home and take care of our kids the way we used it's to be. It's a luxury. Able to. That is a luxury. So it, when I, it's a know, luxury. See, when I, when I listen to people tell their stories about, being, you know, stay-at-home moms, dog. 
That is a privilege. Yeah, and the problem, you know, that's not, you know, that is. Let's just put it out there because I, I, I think the, you know, the the track down memory lane is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, because I'm, I don't ever want to go back <laughs> to the '60s ever. <laughs> There's nothing about the '60s, '50s, '40s, none of that that I would ever. Well, well not want much, to do. not much ever changed in Rising Sun. So right. it's pretty, okay, much, yeah, it's pretty no. much the same now as it was then. Yeah, a bit, I, I'm just going to tell bit you, different, but I, it, 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 Dana I Black could, I would not have made it. <laughs> I in 1960. That. I, I understand that, Dana, but I'm not saying we go back. Yeah, I got you. I'm just I saying you. over the years, we've lost that ability to raise a family the way we used to Absolutely. because of the financial And the demands. nurturing that comes with that. There's and the a, other thing is I people don't have a nest egg anymore. Nest egg? You know, that? You miss a paycheck, and your car's going to get repossessed. Yeah. You miss a paycheck, and you're not going to eat for a week or so. I mean, and that's probably one of two or three jobs you have to carry because nobody Absolutely. wants to hire anybody full time anymore. No, we want to give you thirty hours but, and so we're pay any benefits. But all this started twenty thirty years ago. It was it was a plan. Twenty thirty years ago, and you know where it, when it, it started? The last time we cut taxes. Man, it was a plan. So I was so again. I, I have to be very careful, and I had promised myself I wasn't going to actually say this in public. But I'm going to say it, and and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but oh. business people are intelligent people. Yep. They have the ability to, to see things 20, 30 years down the road when they're planning their business. Mm. We saw, they saw the, the, the economy becoming global. They saw that no longer would the, the wealth of the world be concentrated in Western nations or in our oil-rich nations, right? right. We, we are, listen... We can talk about the con- continent of Africa and how how incredibly mineral rich they were, but yet exploited and really didn't get a chance to cultivate their own wealth mm-hmm. through, through, due to colonization. Please know I know, but these business owners can see twenty years down the road, and it's all everything they put in place, every tax cut, every bill to you know prevent different types of competition mm-hmm. has been to stack chips. Stack chips because of what they know. The, they don't necessarily know what it's going to look like because now I don't. If, if I really wanted to, I don't have to pay you what I pay the people in Bangladesh because we're in a global economy now. But I'm stacking my chips so when it does kind of shift and it's not quite the way that we think it should be, mm-hmm. I'm ready to go. And they have elected and and has, and have helped to elect people that will put the things in place legally, so we don't even have to like we don't even have recourse. Like, we can't say you're cheating. Well, no, it's legal. It's legal. Well, the thing is, not, not, all, business, cons- not all business people are alike. No, 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 no. And, there and, are, no, no, and, no, and no. you know what? Probably the vast majority do things exactly like you said. They make decisions based on what they know they and have reason to believe. But we've got a short-term vision in this country right now. We've got a president whose business history shows that he's a short-term thinker. Yes. I watched Donald Trump stand in front of the Indiana Gaming Commission and promise them what a great casino he was going to build in Orange County. He made mm-hmm. promises to everybody. You he did the same thing in Gary. Donald Trump made promises over this state, and within a few years, he was gone. And those promises were broken. And those businesses ended up in bankruptcy. Snake oil that is his history. Make a quick buck, run up the price, cash out, get out of the way. Snake oil and if you're following that sort of uh, philosophy and government, you're going to hurt this country. Say it. All right, we have. I, I could talk to you all day, and I knew it would be like that. I know, I know. And we got two minutes left. We're gonna go see the grandbaby. Okay, so okay, I got you. <laughs> two minutes left. Give me your door knocking speech. Door knocking speech. I am Lane Sleekman. I'm running for the United States Congress. Um, we have problems in this country, not the kind of problems that we've created, but the problems that we have to solve. And in order to do that, we've got to listen. We've got to listen to people, no matter how big or how small, and take their concerns to the top level. If you help me become a member of Congress, I'm going to listen to you, I'm going to respond to you, and I'm going to do what's best for you and my neighbors and my friends in, the, in this district. I ask for your vote and for your support. Excellent. Now tell them where they can find you. You can find me at www. No, uh, yeah, Lane yeah. Seekman. It's L A N E S I E K M A N dot com. I'm on Facebook. All right. At Lane Seekman. I'm also on Twitter at Lane Seekman, 
And I also live out on Salem Ridge in Ohio County. So if you stop by, you can, you can say, say hello hey, to me. Yeah. Say hey. So I wanted to make sure he got that out. Make sure you donate to his campaign. Make sure you sign up to be a volunteer. It takes an army. It's going to take all of us. Because we, a lot you know, of people. It, listen, Democrats very seldom raise the same amount of money Republicans do. But there's more of us than there are of them. If we galvanize and, we, and become a strong army, take that energy that's bubbling up inside of you. Because it's bubbling up in me. It's bubbling up. And help these candidates win these seats. Talk to your neighbors. Show them why. Give them a chance to, to, to represent us the right way. Not this, this short-sighted, stack my chips, good luck to you, you on your own. We in this together. We're all Americans. When one of us falls, we all fall. You don't get to go to the tip of Florida and pretend like the world ain't.